Okay, our next group is a panel to talk about sustainable use of our natural resources in the state. Uh, some of you may have sat in on some of the earlier sessions this morning. Uh, this group is going to talk to us about how we do that within the con uh, context of sustainability. So let me welcome our panel. The uh, Oregon Business Plan is, is committed to the concept of sustainability and finding solutions that are good for the economy, good for communities, and good for the environment. Uh, obviously, nowhere is this more important than in terms of how we use our natural resources. So this morning we want to showcase three examples of how that works. We're going to talk about water in northeastern Oregon. And two years ago, we highlighted this as an opportunity for Oregon. Since then, under the leadership of the governor's office, agriculture and environmental interests have been working diligently to find solutions to using more water for agricultural interests and for fish in northeastern Oregon. So we're going to start out by listening to <clears throat> a report on how that's going from Craig Reeder, who is an owner of Hale Companies in Echo, Oregon, and Joe Whitworth, who's the president of the Freshwater Trust. Both have participated in this process, led by Oregon Solutions, to utilize Columbia River water more effectively for agriculture and fish alike. So Craig, let's start with you, and why is this such a big opportunity? Well, first off, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, a lot of people have asked about forward progress, and I think the fact that our issue is on the stage here is, uh, is huge forward progress. But I think in, in your backyard, um, maybe a really good hidden secret is is actually the best, one of the best vegetable growing regions in the world. Um, we, can grow, we can grow root crops, we can grow above ground crops, we can grow canes, we can grow vines, and we've got a really unique value proposition. And in our, in our particular area, you know, we'll have root crops such as, you know, mint, potatoes, onions, carrots. And we can generate anywhere from uh, $2 million to $25 million worth of retail sales volume uh, off of a pivot or one circle, 125 acres. That equates to about, you know, $25,000 or so an acre foot for the water. And in my generation's being held to the strictest of sustainability and food safety standards, which I think is, a, is, is pun intended, one of the entrees, one of the entrees that we offer. And it's, it's an, it's, it, the resource has been tapped, and there's a lot more that we can do to that. But the value proposition of Eastern Oregon Irrigated Agriculture as a stable supplier uh, and, and of food products is huge. And not only that, the higher up the value chain, or the higher value crop we raise, the more value we can add to it uh, in our backyard. Instead of just growing a commodity like wheat, which is what I grew up on a wheat farm, uh, we, we, we can actually add that, uh, add that through a, to a, as raw product to a processing plant, put it in containers, uh, and ship it overseas. So if you've eaten a Subway sandwich in Bangor, Maine, you've had a Hermiston onion. If you've eaten a McDonald's French fry in Japan, um, you've had an Oregon potato. So I th we, we're pretty proud of the value proposition that we offer there. As a, as a young man, I used to operate a peace wather, which no longer exists in the age of technology, but I fully understand how important and how fertile those, those lands are for vegetables. So, Joe, why are you committed to this process, and what have you learned from working with Craig? Well, our, our interest here, plainly stated, is uh, we need to recalibrate how agriculture and water interface in general. And the Umatilla offers a great opportunity, we believe, to, to really brain through uh, how this ought to work. And the broader context is, you know, the, the biosphere is the ultimate closed loop system. We don't have any more or any less water today uh, than we did when Earth opened up for business. That hasn't changed. Uh, what has changed is the quality and the character of the water when it shows up or if it shows up at all. And in, uh, in the case of, of water resources, 
those changes have been done uh, primarily through our own management. And uh, the implications for mismanagement we're starting to see or have seen for a while now. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we have listed 28 uh, species of Pacific salmon under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we have recovered none. Uh, and that needs to shift. The, and in the, the case of the Umatilla, where I mean, the fact is we didn't set the, the water bank accounts up correctly. Um, we set them up best we could, but um, we didn't anticipate how things were going to be in 20, 30, 50 years down the line. And since the 1970s, we have, uh, the aquifer over there has dropped in some cases 500 feet, which puts it uh, among the world's largest drops. And uh, agriculture is, and I can say this because I did grow, I spent my summers bucking hay, um, and uh, agriculture is at once the most critical and ecologically destructive activity on the face of the earth. Uh, and in the next 40 years, we have to produce more food uh, to feed more mouths than we have in all of human history. So we have to find a new balance here, and figuring that out at this point in the game is going to take a test case. And I, again, I think the opportunity uh, to get ag more profitable and uh, provide some economic as well as environmental gain lives in the Umatilla. It's good to hear both of you uh, articulate a way that sounds like you're going to be able to work together, but can you tell me a little bit, Craig, how you feel about and what you've learned from working with Joe? Yeah, I, I think, you know, thank you to a lot of people that have, that have set the forum up of which Joe and I have been able to, uh, to interact. I'd like to thank my bosses, Bob and Rick Hale, and a lot of the risks that were taken to develop these food companies that we talked about up there. And I think, for me, this is an astute group, so I was thinking about a good way to articulate this, so I thought I would try and impress them, Joe, by saying that, that a couple years ago I, I had a moment of clarity by, and I was studying one of my favorite philosophers, but I know you would know better, and really what really happened, I was watching a Dr. Seuss movie, uh, doc, uh, with The Lorax, with my kids. This is the philosopher. Yeah, this is the philosopher. And, and at the end of the day, I, you know, I don't want to be the onceler. And, and, you know, Oregon's natural resource development, natural resource use over time, I think, is, is, is safe to say been overzealous at times. And we have to take that into consideration. And, and I think one of the things that's been great is, is to provide, and, and the governor's leadership has provided the forum for me to do a necessary thing, which is to articulate to Joe how I'm not the onceler and I don't want to be the onceler. And as cheesy as that may sound, that's really what it's all about. And so ag, at the end of the day, our missing piece right now, we, we, can, we can make carrots and, and, and ship them across the globe. We can, we can make a whole bunch of very yummy treats, and, and, and we can, we can t take the ebbs and flows out of too much rain and not enough rain with dry irrigated agriculture. But at the end of the day, we have to do it sustainably, and we need to make an, you know, forward progress on the environmental gains. And so what we've needed, the missing piece to us, is a list a list and a forum for the ag community to engage in the net environmental benefit, if you will, for lack of a better vernacular, a way for us to engage that process. And that's one of the things that Joe, that this forum has allowed Joe to say, what's a win for you, and me to say, what's a win for you. And literally, we're excited about the fact that this forum is going to be able to provide that deliverable of both a win for the, you know, for the environmental piece, and for the fisheries, and for the ag use. And, and it's, going to be, it's going to be great, and, and we're, having a, we're having a good time doing it, right, Joe? Goodish. Goodish, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. It's, uh, it's really uh, very interesting to hear this because it's a, it's a tribute to the fact that the business plan has provided a forum for these conversations. The governor has now taken this up and moved it along to the point now where you're hearing two people that uh, a few years ago may not have been quite as close together on, on the benefits of this process sound very much as though they're going to get together and get this done. And that's, that's terrific. Thank you both very much. Thanks for the opportunity. So let's turn to our forests, uh, another area where there's absolutely no emotion in the state of Oregon. Uh, last year, the business plan challenged Oregon to double the pace of forest thinning in our fire-prone eastern Oregon forests for the benefit of the economy and the environment alike. Uh, Bruce Doc Savage, 
Uh, to my left is the president of Ojico Lumber, and he's been in the middle of these efforts. He lives in Bend and runs a lumber mill and pellet plant in John Day. Bruce, last summer you announced that you were going to close the mill in John Day. Can you give us uh, an update on that and tell us what happened? Sure, Jim. You know, after 75 years of sawmilling in central and eastern Oregon, due to the lack of a consistent supply of timber, we were forced to announce our shutdown. Now, John Day is in Grant County. In Grant County, we have the dubious honor of having the highest unemployment rate in, the, in all of Oregon. It's at 13.6%. So when we talk about the fiscal cliff and going over it, we are hanging on to that cliff by our fingernails. Fortunately, Senator, uh, Senators Wyden and Merkley intervened along with our governor and some of our friends in the environmental community and were able to shake the trees up a bit and we were able to get a few logs to keep, to keep our mill going. We believe there's a longer term solution that will be coming into the spring and due to the great work of our collaborative efforts over in uh, Grant County, we think that a long-term solution is, is viable. Uh, can you give us a little update? I remember a, as, as a young man growing up in Eastern Oregon that the forest in Eastern Oregon differed from Western Oregon because they were so open. You could, you could go through the forest, you could see things, you could see out ahead of yourself. Can you give us an update on where the forest in Eastern Oregon are today? Well, from this photograph, you can see this is a condition of some of the forests in eastern Oregon that are crowded. Um, historically, we usually have around 75 to 100 trees per acre. We're now crowding to the tune of about 1,500 trees per acre. This creates overstocking, it creates some real forest health issues, and it creates a huge fire uh, danger. These forests need thinning and mills need the timber. You can see by these crown fires that due to the amount of fiber on the ground, uh, they burn hot. This year, more than a million acres of lands were burned in, in Oregon. That cost uh, the state and the federal government over $100 million. I wouldn't mind having a fraction of that action, John, to use to uh, do some thinning projects on our forests. So if thinning the forest is good for the economy, it's good for communities, and it's good for the ecology, what are we actually doing about it? Well, the governor has uh, put together a great opportunity for uh, Eastern Oregon in the way of uh, his Federal Forest Advisory Committee. This committee meets monthly and works in conjunction with collaboratives and helps fund collaboratives throughout Oregon. Now you look at this map and you, in the far well, we'll call it the eastern side of, the, of Oregon in the orange, you'll see the Blue Mountain Forest Collaborative. This group has been working together for over six years. Finally, after, we'll call it a treaty with some of our members in the environmental community and our local communities, we've got plans in place to put together some additional thinning to bring mills, to bring saw timber to the mills. Last year, we, we thinned about 129,000 acres. Uh, we expect 250,000 acres that will need to be thin in the immediate future in order to meet uh, the needs of, uh, of a healthy environment and get our jobs in our mills going again. Well, so what is the next thing on the agenda for you? Well, we're very hopeful that the governor will intervene with the congressional leaders and staff to put together an expert panel to study um, not only the map, a policy map of going forward, but also to get uh, Senator Wyden's East Side Forest Bill going again. Uh, we have huge bottlenecks in the planning process. In order to do these large projects, it takes a lot of money. We've got to find a consistent, reliable funding source. We've got some plans to do that. We need to work together to find these resources and to keep those resources in the system year after year after year. Uh, during our breakout session this afternoon at 1.30, we're going to be discussing a potential plan uh, through the, uh, the National Forest Health Restoration Studies, and we hope that you can join us at 1.30 and learn more about what this plan might be. Thanks, John.
Uh, thanks, Bruce. That's a very positive update on what's happening in our eastern Oregon forest, uh, the potential that we have, and, and, and you've heard a number of times, you'll hear more if you attend the panel this afternoon, about the coalescence of a number of different interest groups and our political leaders around trying to find a good solution to, to this issue. So let me now turn to uh, Tom Tuckman, the governor's forestry and conservation finance advisor, and ask him a little bit about what's going on and what are the challenges in the southern part of the state. Uh, John, before I uh, thanks for that, and, and Bruce, your your work on the east side is is truly inspiring and uh, a real model, not just for Oregon but but around the region, and the country, and uh, we're trying to take some of your lessons and apply them to the west side. Uh, but before I begin uh, on the challenges, let me talk a little bit about what we're talking, uh, sort of the acronym soup that is federal forest policy. Um, uh, the U.S. Forest Service owns about seven million acres around uh, around Oregon. And then we have a unique category of lands called the Oregon and California Grant Lands. Um, that, those, uh, this is a, a map of those lands in purple. And there's actually about uh, a small portion of Oregon and California lands and that are actually managed by the Forest Service. And the unique, uh, unique thing about these lands is that they were uh, granted to a railroad on alternating sections in the 1800s and then they reverted back to the federal government uh, in 1916 and then in 1937, a, a law was passed that said 50% of timber harvest revenues that were generated from uh, those lands would go back to, the, to, to 18 what are called ONC counties that actually are not just southern Oregon but go all the way up into uh, Columbia County and northern, uh, northern Oregon as well. So uh, between 1960 and 1990, uh, counties were about 1.2 billion board feet was harvested, and the counties received about $134 million in payments on a, on a, in real terms. The Northwest Forest Plan was passed in 1994, and uh, harvest dropped down uh, dramatically, about 90% on these ONC lands, from 1.2 to about, uh, about 100 million board feet today. And to make up for that difference in, in uh, financing of the counties, there were a series of, uh, of, of payments made sort of in lieu of or independent of timber supply. Well, given the budget situation, that's, uh, uh, that's become increasingly difficult, notwithstanding the heroic efforts of, of the Oregon, uh, Senator Wyden, and Senator Merkley, and the Oregon delegation. Um, uh, and so we're in a situation where we have challenge number one, timber supply, was supposed to actually increase over time as second growth reached rotation age and the subsequent payments would, would, uh, uh, would, would move along parallel and commensurate with that. Two, because that hasn't happened, supply has actually dropped. We're in a situation where six or seven counties, primarily in southern Oregon and central Oregon, uh, are facing an uh, insolvency crisis and another six or seven are, uh, are, are severely impacted. And three, to, to solve this problem, it's easy to say, yeah, let's increase federal timber supply. You have to make some really difficult trade-offs on the west side between habitat that's required for uh, various endangered species and a silviculture, a forest management approach that does more uh, regeneration harvest clear-cutting than on the east side where you do um, uh, more thinning. And so, you know, 24 bills were introduced on this issue between 1988 and 1992, and I think two got out of sub, a subcommittee because they were always introduced by one part, you know, one perspective or the other. And so what the governor has asked us to do is uh, come up with a collaborative process, you know, again, building on what happened on the east side. And we have a great group of uh, conservationists, industry, and community representatives that are meeting once a week, twice a week, uh, for about eight to 12 weeks to see if we can come up with a collaborative solution on on uh, ways to increase federal timber supply, provide uh, payments to, to counties, and to provide adequate habitat. Uh, it's going to be a tough road. Uh, the group is very sincere. They're working hard for a solution. Uh, I, I think we're, Oregon's going to be able to put its best foot forward. Even if we don't have 100% agreement, I think we're going to be coming up with some, some uh, opportunities for uh, the delegation to consider. Well, thank you very much. I think. Uh, when you hear from all of these folks, what you realize is these are very tough issues. There's no single silver bullet to solve any of them. And uh, we owe 
all the people who are working on those issues, uh, it, the people on the panel here in particular, a great vote of thanks for taking on these tough issues because as citizens of this state, we need them to succeed. And I want to also point out, as several have, a lot of this collaborative effort, uh, which hopefully will be the first time we have a breakthrough on these issues in 30 plus years, a lot of it is being pushed by Governor Kitzhaber and uh, we owe him a vote of thanks for getting that process started. <clears throat> and we wish you the very best of luck in getting all these tough problems solved. So thank you very much. <clears throat> all right. Thanks.